but happiness comes from meaning and purpose mm. you know pleasure can go up and down depending on what you're doing but you can reach a level of happiness which can go up or down if big things happen in your life but it tends to stay more stable hello and welcome to this week's episode of the burnt chef journal a hospitality specific podcast dedicated to challenging mental health stigma and conversations designed to inspire a new, healthier, happier, and more sustainable hospitality profession. I'd like to introduce to you another guest chef for the Burnt Chef Journal, who will be putting together a mini series based on topics that are important to her and that I think will be and also important to the rest of our listeners as well. Julia is one of our ambassadors and she is a trained transformation coach and master of self-discovery. She's been a professional chef, a teacher, a radio personality and writer and through her life experiences including over 20 years in hospitality I think it's fair to say that Julia has experienced a fair bit of life including single parenthood, homelessness, menopause, depression and divorce. Julia's learned that to make any real change in your life, you have to start from within. And so I really am excited to hear the conversations that she has with her guests on subject matters that are important to her, to the hospitality community, and most importantly, to yourselves. So welcome, Julia. Hello, everybody. My name is Julia Erdl, and I'm a professional chef hospitality professional. I'm a transformation coach, master of self-discovery, teacher, radio personality, writer, and everything else surrounding food, cooking, and eating, and living good life. So I am so pleased to be able to be hosting this a mini series for the burnt chef project and if you didn't know what the burnt chef project is all about well did you know that four out of five hospitality professionals report having experienced at least one mental health issue during their career the burnt chef project is a globally recognized not-for-profit social enterprise fully committed to making the hospitality profession healthier and more sustainable by focusing on people's well-being first. So I'm going to be hosting a series of podcasts interviewing some of my fantastic friends, all related or involved in some way to mental health, to well-being, to living a holistic life. And my first guest, I'm really pleased to introduce is Paula Gardner. So Paula, welcome Paula. Hi (laughs) here. Hello. So Paula Gardner is a business psychologist and psychotherapist. Paula is also a coach. She is the author of Get Noticed, Do Your Own PR and The Career Pause and Pivot. Paula works with clients dealing with anxiety, depression, feelings of overwhelm, OCD, phobias and trauma, as well as running workshops for mental health for businesses. Now, Paula is going to be talking to us today about nine essential human needs. Do you know the nine vital needs that every human has and needs to be met to balance our lives? Too much or too little of these needs, and we can find ourselves in a state of mental distress, illness, depression, anxiety, and more. So I'm pleased to say Paula is going to reveal to us today what these needs are and the resources we can tap into to have those needs fulfilled. She's also going to be sharing what you need to do and how to do a needs audit in your own personal and professional life and ideas on what to do if you feel your needs are unbalanced. So welcome, Paula. I love you. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> That's absolute pleasure. I love that. I love when we first talked and I said to you, you know, let's, uh, what can we talk about? You know, what can we bring out there to the world to educate people and help people and support people? And, and when you mentioned about these nine needs, even I was surprised, even I didn't know what they were. So it's going to be a really fascinating conversation. I'm really looking forward to this. So first okay. question I really wanted to ask you though, is now you're not just any old psychotherapist you are a human givens psychotherapist 
So what I want you to know really, and I'm sure the audience would love to know is, what is the difference between that and being an other psychotherapist out there? Okay, there are hundreds of different types of psychotherapists. There are different schools, person-centered, psychodynamic, Freudian, CBT. There are many, many different schools of psychotherapy out there. And, you know, some people are drawn to different things to others. So the way that human givens differs is for a start, it's very solution focused. So it's about helping you feel better right now. It's not about digging around in your past for why you're feeling like this. Although, obviously, if things come up from the past, they're they're talked about and addressed. But it's about practical solutions to help you feel better. You know, if you go to a therapy session, your first therapy session, and you are feeling, you know, all the symptoms of anxiety or depression, you know, it's not an exciting prospect to think, oh, I'm going to have to sit through 15 sessions to actually feel better. So we're all about, you know, getting things changed from the beginning. Right. So as well as being solution focused, the human givens refers to the needs, which we're going to be talking about, and also the resources that every human has to get those needs met. Wow. Yeah, that just sounds really fascinating. And I'm just really, really curious to find out about those needs, actually. Mm. I think it's really positive and uplifting to think that there's an opportunity here for a session and having therapy that is very much solution focused, very much focused on, you know, kind of the present and getting you moving forward rather than, like you said, you know, rehashing the past or dragging up the past. And yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. It's important to address when things do show up, but don't dwell on that, isn't it? Don't get stuck in that mm. space. Yeah, it's very easy to get stuck in, in that space. And I've I've come to human given psychotherapy from a background originally in my early, early career from PR and marketing, and then as a business psychologist. So I do like things which are very empowering. You know, I like my clients to go away with something that they can do that week, you know, Amazing. something practical that can make them feel better. Yeah. 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 No. And that's the thing, isn't it? That's absolutely the the, the key word here is empowerment, isn't it? Mm. It's that total lifting of the soul, lifting of the spirit, empowering someone to feel that, yeah, that, you know, it isn't all the past it isn't all what happened to them but actually that there is light you know there is actually light at the end of the tunnel yeah hope hope and all the the needs and the resources you know it's it's evidence-based that's the other thing which I think is really important it's very easy to sit down and make up a theory (laughs) yeah you know a theory of oh if you like cats then this you're this sort of person you know it's so easy and you know people can base whole personality quizzes around them but you know a lot of well you know this is evidence-based it's taken from you know scientific studies and resources and proven theories yeah yeah no absolutely absolutely so let's get stuck in let's talk about these nine needs because I want to know about all of them so first thing to say is these are emotional needs because obviously even before those are met we've got needs for you know food and water and shelter and so on so you know if you know Maslow's pyramid yeah and you know that's the basic so you've got to be safe and nurtured physically and then then you move on to getting your emotional needs met yes and the thing about these needs which is really important to remember is we all need them in different amounts so for instance the first one is control so you will have a need for control in your life, Julia, which is different to mine. So when we say about meeting the, getting these needs met in balance, it's all about that balance for that individual. There is no sort of set point that everyone needs to reach. It's thinking about your own needs. Yeah. Your own level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, immediately when I think about control and stuff, it, you know, my mind jumps straight to a busy kitchen. Yeah, <laughs> and of course. Sure. <laughs> you know, mm. it is all about controlling the staff, controlling the food, controlling temperatures, controlling, you know, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot yeah. of pressure when you're in that yeah. hot 
boiling kitchen and there's a lot of tension and everyone's going at it and especially if it's a really busy kitchen we've got a really busy evening lots of covers and everyone's got their role and it is as the head chef or the sous chef the head chef the executive chef you are the one that ultimately is in control of that kitchen and one thing out of place and it could all just come crashing down and it does really make me think of that actually mm, mm, yeah and the same if you're running a hotel you know yeah. you don't have that control about when the rooms are cleaned and you know that there's going to be somebody there to welcome you know visitors in then your business can go you know down the drain mm. and it's interesting what you're saying about the kitchen because actually in my head I immediately felt safety you know that control there is safety for everybody isn't it as well oh yeah absolutely 100 this is the thing I mean you know food safety is quite a key element of any mm. kitchen really and yeah if tensions run high or people start getting really you know frustrated it can cause accidents it can cause yeah. problems so yeah absolutely being yeah. in control but I mean you know the thing is is there's is there good control bad control like in well, our life about the balance thing yeah so if, yeah. so okay that's a kitchen but thinking about an individual mm. I mean a nice easy way to sort of illustrate it would be somebody feeling that they're in control let's say somebody working in a kitchen and yeah. let's say that this is somebody that's got lots of ideas and really wants to bring them in and they've spoken to you know maybe management maybe head chef or whatever and there's just no option for them there's no way for them to bring any of their ideas in then that person is going to feel a lack of control which means that their need for control is not being met which means that possibly they may go looking for another job looking for something you know thinking about retention for instance you know, obviously there's a hierarchy, but, you know, people do need to feel that they have control over some things. Mm. Offering people control over like choice of shifts, for instance, is another way to give people that feeling of control. Being told all the time when you have to work takes away that feeling of control. And just thinking about it in terms of your own career, you know, feeling that you are in control of what your next step might be and when you might go for it and so on, mm. as opposed to a lack of balance would be feeling out of control, stuck in a job or juggling two jobs or three jobs to make mm. ends meet money wise. Because, mm. you know, with all this cost of living crisis, I can already see that people are starting to feel out of control yeah yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and, and that is the thing isn't it totally I, I really hear you and I guess sort of you know thinking about it from the hospitality sector or just anyone with a career I mean we are known for having quite high staff turnovers mm. because people either burn out really quickly people you know or maybe they don't have job satisfaction it's interesting because it's a bit of a double-edged sword with hospitality because it's such an incredible sector I mean it's such an incredible industry with such fast promotional prospects with such opportunities for so many different jobs Mm. within the industry it's crazy the amount of opportunities that you can have in hospitality I mean ultimately it's a job it's a career for life but there are the negative sides of it as well. There are those little bad points where if you don't feel that your needs are being met, if you don't feel that you are being heard, listened to, or that, yeah, if the hours are just not working for you, and it can be quite intense environment, especially if you're a chef, and then, of course, it is very easy to quickly fall out of that control and to yeah. feel quite overwhelmed, actually, in yeah. some ways. So well, so let's talk about... You can be promoted to a position of being, let's say, a hotel manager yeah. or, and actually realize that you don't want this control over all the people it is too much and that's that's very common people who are very good at their job move up and then they go into management where they're not necessarily doing the thing that they loved (laughs) you know what yeah they're they're managing people and they don't they haven't really had training for it and actually it's probably not what they're interested in yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I do and, see that as well. Yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. So let's talk about another need. Let me know about another need. Then. Yeah. So sort of linked to control is a feeling of security. Ah, of course. So obviously I'm not in hospitality, but one of the, the sort of cliches from outside is that hot-headed chef that shouts at you in the kitchen. And, you know, one of those reasons I know is because it runs on a tight schedule and anybody that doesn't keep up lets everybody else down. But if you are working in an environment where you actually feel unsafe, 
yeah. then that is taking away your sense of security. This could be, you know, in a, in a kitchen where you you literally feel unsafe, or it yeah. could be where you feel in, you know, a hotel or mm. a resort where you feel bullied, for instance. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think even when you go back to the pandemic and COVID, I think there must have been lots of people who felt very unsafe at that time. And now even like with the cost of living crisis, lots of people feeling unsafe. Yeah, because obviously when the pandemic hit, the hospitality sector was affected quite hard. And obviously there was that whole sort of that security, that safety net was almost pulled from under your Mm. feet. Yeah. Yeah. And too much security, or it would be if, you know, if you are, for instance, we all know people who stay in a job longer than they should. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. so not being brave enough to actually, you know, apply for a promotion or mm-hmm. speak about wanting more responsibility or getting that new job when, you know, the job that you're in is, is not serving you at all. Yeah. Yeah. So basically too much security and, and it can keep you fearful. And again, you know, both of these different people will have them in different needs. Mm. Um, that being stuck in your comfort zone, isn't it? Is that yes. being in your comfort zone and then not, you know, obviously if you do want to progress, if you do want progression, if you do want to move up in any part of your life, there has to be that level of some uncomfortability in yeah. order to really motivate you to push you forward, right? Yeah, yeah. And again, you can see it with control when people are trying, if people are feeling out of control in their lives, they will try and grasp at things to make them feel more in control. Yeah. So they might yeah. become more sort of dominating or domineering at home because they're trying to get that sense of control or you know they might end up doing you know sort of weird rituals in an OCD type way when people feel lack of control then often you know sort of like you go into rituals like checking all the lights are off or washing your hands and so on to actually give you that sense of control so you can see how it starts to relate to sort of yeah and mental distress don't can't you absolutely absolutely 100% I mean I'm sort of looking forward to hearing about all the needs because I'm imagining that, yeah, they are all very much interrelated and very much affect our everyday lives. Like you said, OCD, quite a key Mm -hmm. one, really. So tell us about another need then. So the next one is privacy or privacy, depending on how you pronounce it. (laughs) And this is an interesting one, which really obviously came out during the pandemic when, you know, there were many, many people who, you know, were living as a family crammed into small space and they, they couldn't get out. So that fundamental need for many people was not there during that time. So you can see that, that, you know, how that was threatened. Yeah. I mean, I think with the hospitality sector, that can be quite challenging, actually, in terms of privacy, having time to yourself because of the hours that we do. Yes. There's such long hours. I mean, it's notorious that some people do yeah. you know, six, 70 split hours. Shifts and so on, yeah, yeah. yeah, split shifts, double yeah. shifts, you know, people in the kitchen, all very busy, but also I guess the good and the bad is that when hospitality, they are, it becomes your family because you spend a majority mm. of your time there at work with these people. So you hang out together afterwards, yeah. you go out together, you do stuff together and you do, you tend to see them more than you do your own family or more you'll get to yourself because the rest of the time you're probably sleeping because you're so knackered and then you yeah. obviously get up and you start over again so I can see how privacy obviously for us can be quite a massive issue to be honest yeah. and what happens if you don't get that privacy then so like if you're lacking in privacy what can it result in okay so well well one it can result in just feeling sort of overwhelmed or claustrophobic in a way really Mm. I mean Mm. with privacy it doesn't always have to mean that physical space so for instance yes if you are doing the shifts and you're going home and you're sleeping but you know you have a nice walk to work on your own or you can get on the tube and and listen to a podcast or your music or whatever that can count towards privacy as well so basically it's 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 a sense, it's a feeling of time to yourself. Right. So one thing that I do advise, you know, if your life is busy and, and you know, you're going from one thing to the next, is making the most of those pauses, those trips in between things to make it 
feel to give the illusion that you have some privacy and some space to yourself and also use it wisely if you are grabbing a coffee then actually sit down and maybe you know do a little bit of journaling and catch up with your thoughts or sit by a window and people watch or or look out at nature to get off your phone and again that will help give you that sense of privacy because right, obviously yeah. on your phone, everything is crowding into your head, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Notifications, totally. Facebook posts and so on. Does that does not contribute to privacy? Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And I can really see that. I'm always encouraging my clients as well. Take time out. What are you doing for you? Where's your me time? we call it and you know what can you do today even if it's just for 30 minutes or an hour that actually is devoted to just yourself you know yeah Yeah, definitely so give us another needs how many have we done now how many needs is that so far now we've been that's four so was that three sorry so the fourth one would be achievement a sense of achievement Right. I mean, this is pretty obvious in that, you know, if we achieve things, first of all, every time we achieve something, we get a nice sort of reward with a hit of dopamine, which makes us feel good. And this kind of apply from everything to get into that next level on PlayStation to crossing something off your to do list to yeah. you know, a batch of, I don't know, sausage rolls coming out just in time. Yeah. So it can apply to little things, but also it applies to big things. So, you know, you'll get promoted at work and you feel that that sense of achievements. Yes. You know, head chef comments on your work and they're not particularly, you know, generous with compliments. So that would give you a sense of achievement. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not to say that our life should be driven by this, but it is a need. We need to achieve things. And when we're not achieving things, we get bored. And, you know, that's a prime sort of like. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, definitely in the hospitality sector, there's masses of achievement. I mean, it's Mm. it's very much, I'd say, achievement driven to it, especially as a chef, because ultimately it's about making sure that the food is cooked to the right degree, the right consistency, the right texture, the right flavour. You know, it looks great. And then obviously ultimate achievement is when the customers come back and say they're so happy yes. and that they've enjoyed Views. what they've had. Yeah. And that, yeah, absolutely. The reviews. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, achievement is quite crucial. But yeah, I like what you said. Like the fact is, don't let your life be totally governed by that achievement, because otherwise what can happen? You know, if, well, yeah, if it's you're, all- just on, you're just on the rat reel, aren't you? Just going round yeah. and round from one achievement to the next. Yeah. So, yes. If you're too achievement focused, then it's not being met in balance. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and it may be that your family are suffering as a result, you know. Yeah, totally. Well, no, because you become obsessed. Mm. You become obsessed with the achievement. You're you're totally driven, aren't you, about that? It's like watching those old films, isn't it, from the 80s and the 90s, you know, that sort of, that culture. Wall Street, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Wall Street, yeah, yeah, that's it, the Wolf of Wall Street. (laughs) Exactly, (laughs) exactly. And then you do, you just like, you get really frustrated. There's a brilliant film that came out called Boiling Point, and that was very much one shot in the sort of a scene from a kitchen one Mm. evening. And it was, and the emotions, the highs, the lows, you know, how of a busy kitchen of a restaurant Mm. and the things that kind of resulted out of that. And they're making it into a series now, actually, but absolutely incredible. And I I felt it was quite on point, actually. I thought it was quite, you know, and very much definitely about that. And all the needs were definitely in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us about our fifth need. So the next need is status. A need for status. And people often sort of raise an eyebrow when you say status. They go, oh, no, I don't need status. I'm quite happy. But basically, this means just being recognized for your work. So yeah. let's say you're working in a busy kitchen and you, you know, you're doing your job and you're getting paid for it. Well, but at some point now and again, just you know, a little a well done or you know, just something, some recognition that you, yeah. you know, the job that you're doing and People can see your good attitude, the effort that you're putting in. So this is a warning to all employers out there. (laughs) Yeah, people people need to be recognised and they need their their efforts and their attitude to be recognised because, you know, if you don't feel that you have that status, let's say it's a team and you don't feel that you're a full part of the team. Yes. 
Yes. And it's going to make you feel isolated. So some people, you know, it might result in sort of that feeling of isolation, worry, leading to mm. anxiety, which then leads, you know, to depression. Or for some people, they might just like cut loss and, and go and go somewhere else where, mm. you know, they will have that, that need for status. Mm. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? So status is more the recognition. So it's kind of like, as you mentioned about teamwork and obviously teams are huge. So when, you know, in my days of, of teaching and, and teaching young chefs, we talk a lot about teams and about mm. teamwork and about being part of that team and and your role within that team. And obviously in the hospitality sector, it is all about teams. It is all about yes, working together. But there is also lots of ego. Mm. And I thought, let me just throw that one in the mix as well to you because, you know, status, recognition, how do you sort of cope and deal with that when you've got someone, your boss or your manager, or your head chef or whatever, who is so ego driven, you know, mm. how does that affect you Mm. well status is an interesting one because it's given by other people (laughs) like Mm. if you are clambering and claiming it yourself it's not it doesn't quite work so status is given to you by other people as in the recognition so yeah if you you know you're dealing with a lot of egos and you're not getting noticed or you just listen to you know then yes Mm -hmm. It's has a recipe for disaster to use. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sure is, definitely. Yeah. But thinking um, about what you said about teamwork. So our next need is connection. So right. it sounds like, you know, working in, in a kitchen mm. in that team will actually provide that. So with connection, we all basically need somebody, at least somebody. It doesn't have to be a romantic partner. It could be your mum. But, you know, somebody that understands and accepts you for who you are you know warts and all they're not trying to change you and that you can feel yourself with and when you don't have that again that can make you feel isolated so it's really important if you're enjoying this week's episode consider heading over to our website and supporting our ongoing work in destigmatizing mental illness and creating a healthier happier and more sustainable industry By purchasing some of our branded merchandise, we have a whole range of t-shirts, hoodies, chef's jackets, well-being journals, plus a whole host more available on Worldwide Dispatch. All funds raised from sales of these items go towards free-to-access e-learning content, as well as providing free support systems and help for those who may be experiencing difficulty with their mental health. I do love that whole connection thing because again yeah in the sector we do have a lot we are very connected we have a lot Mm. of connection you know across the board in hospitality really and especially if you're working as part of a brigade as we call them in the um, in the kitchen as chefs we are all connected because Mm. obviously they're all working to a, a common goal of ensuring that that restaurant or you know that hotel or whatever it is is run properly effectively efficiently and that everybody's happy and the customers are happy so connection is crucial but Mm. you know it's interesting with connection as well though because sometimes if people aren't they don't have a really great home life or things aren't working so well at home work can become their salvation in some Mm. ways you know so yeah and I I think that's actually something that you know bosses take note you know um, team leaders managers take note because you know it's really great to talk to your staff because if you know and in fact if you see that their work is affected a little bit it's worth having that conversation with them because it could be that there is a lack of control or connection or status Mm. or achievement or anything going on either at work or at home that could Mm. be affecting their their mindset and how they feel you know within themselves their emotions yeah yeah Mm -hmm. but again thinking about it being met in balance you're craving too much connection you know that could basically mean that you come this is more of a relationship thing you might come over as being too needy and scare the other person away or you know you're perhaps scared to leave something that might be abusive, abusive relationship, because you don't want to lose that connection. You become confused. You're confused about the actual type of connection that you've got there. Because if you don't know any better, or if you haven't learned any other way, or if that person has made you feel a certain way, then yes, you like you said, it's, it's feeling needy, but also feeling a very low self-esteem and low self-worth. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, sometimes they they may be linked, but also linked to that connection is the community that you've been speaking of. So that's our next need. 
And again, you know, some people need this more than others. Extroverts probably need this a lot more than than some introverts. But that yeah. sense of community, of belonging. So, yeah, it does sound like hospitality does provide that. You know, too much of it, it can feel claustrophobic. You know, you mm. might be part of a community that you don't particularly like. You might not like your workmates. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, but I mean, that yeah. can be absolutely true. It can. Yeah. Or again, you know, you mentioned about, you know, them sticking together and, and going out after work for drinks, you know, too much of that and your home life or your or your other connections might suffer. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But, but the thing is that, you know, we, we know that to be true. We've seen mm. that, we've heard that where um, home life does suffer when you're spending all of your time at work and you're not getting that work-life balance. You know, that's that's those key phrase that we've got so used to hearing now. And the hospitality sector can sometimes not be so favourable to that. Things are changing, though. Things are absolutely mm. 100 changing and there are some incredible companies out there that are really promoting work-life balance more teamwork more um, team building activities and also uh, you know more perks at work job sharing better hours and this is what we look for I mean I think community are uh, you know my family are, are, are Cypriot Turkish Cypriot and, and coming from that sort of background um, community is quite a, a huge thing for us actually uh, community connection coming mm. together eating together, you know, um, sharing stories, being together and mixing with each other. It's really lovely. And then, you know, all mixing with loads of other people and being able to share each other's ideas and stuff. Like, you know, our community is a huge one for me because I know you mentioned about introvert and extrovert and we've laughed about this. We've had these conversations where, you know, I'm probably f- fall more in that extroverted side of things. Doesn't mean I'm loud and brash, but I guess I do love socialising. I love meeting people and meeting new people and getting to know people and hearing people's stories. It's just uh, something that I'm quite passionate about. And yeah, I suppose if you're an introverted person, I mean, especially if you went into hospitality, that might be quite a challenge, do you think? Yeah, because introverts will need more time on their own. It's not Mm. about how loud they might be, but they extroverts recharge by being around other people and introverts mm-hmm. recharge with time on their own mm. yeah so as long as you know that and you can plan around it yeah yeah you know, absolutely you're right but it's it's knowing yourself isn't it it's understanding yeah. yourself and your own needs yeah completely, yeah. So completely. Introverts might need more of that privacy yeah. yeah yeah so that's oh my god so we've already been through seven needs now so tell us the eighth need paula so the eighth is attention so again, it sounds a bit like oh, attention, but we we all need attention. You know, you do sort of hear of of those long term marriages where people just sort of like live in the same house and <laughs> don't yeah. give each other any attention. Yeah, you know, it's sort of run it run its course. So we need yeah. attention from other people. So you know, just think about having a conversation. We, we've all met those people who you know you say how are you and they're and then 20 minutes later they're like oh it's great nice to see you and you haven't said a thing you know (laughs) that's the conversation where you haven't had any attention and you start you know if that carries on then you start avoiding them in, in the street because you you know you just can't be bothered to waste that 20 minutes of time but also giving attention we need to give attention to others yes Definitely, definitely. Like giving attention to children, right? Yeah. And they want yeah. to you. I mean, that's a really oh. obvious one, isn't it? Giving attention to your kids or nephews or whatever it may be. Um, mentoring is a lovely way to give attention and actually being mentored too for getting getting that attention. Yeah. So again, another plea to employers, you know, putting a buddy system in or, you know, actually, you know, mentoring, setting up a mentoring system is a really nice way to get that oh, yeah. net in both you know, in both ways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I love that. I love that whole idea of a buddy system. And, you know, we do see that in hospitality, actually, mm. where you get sort of paired up with someone to sort of shadow them, watch them and, and for them to support you. And again, you know, it swings and roundabouts. Some companies are brilliant at this. Some need a little bit more help, you know, need a bit more attention to do this. So, you know, but I know, I know that one, you know, when you've, you know, I've had a few friends like that, you sort of meet them, you bump into them and then it's all about them and they talk about themselves. And then by the time you come away from the conversation you haven't like you said said anything my coping strategy for that is I normally then will phone call a friend or something just to have a chat (laughs) and sort of get over that but you know or or just laugh about it to be honest Mm. 
you know, maybe I'm, I've just got you, I don't need as much attention maybe as someone else might do. But it is important to be heard. And that's really what mm. shows up when you talk about attention. It's that being listened to and mm. actually being heard. It's easy to listen to somebody, but not actually hear what they're saying to you. So, you yeah. know, hearing what someone's <clears throat> saying and, and genuinely taking an interest in them without passing judgment, I think is, it. and, you know, without the sort of desire to immediately offer advice as well, actually, yeah. I think is quite key. So the last need. The last for- one. So I've left the biggest to last. Well, Oh. So the biggest is meaning and purpose, which sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I was having a conversation earlier this morning about the difference between pleasure and, and happiness. So, yeah, we might get pleasure from pleasure from our, you know, buying something or pleasure from, you know, a date with somebody or, you know, sharing a, a, a joke or whatever it might be. And this is not to demean those things because they're all really important. But happiness comes from meaning and purpose. Mm. You know, pleasure can go up and down depending on what you're doing, but you can reach a level of happiness, which can go up or down if big things happen in your life. But it tends to stay more stable. So I see a lot of people like this who've, you know, maybe have very successful careers and they've reached a point in their life and they say, oh, I don't feel like my life has much meaning or purpose. Yeah. Actually. yeah. That's uh, and right. sometimes it's a spiritual thing. Sometimes it, it's about, you know, the rekindling their mm-hmm. spirituality or, you know, religious practices. Yeah. So that's really, I suppose it's not having way. A sometimes people yeah. have forgotten about it, way to get that meaning and purpose. Another is by, you know, doing things, you know, doing their work. Yeah, I think it's feeling important. it has a value. And then the yeah. other way is, is actually by their status. So people often get meaning and purpose through you know being a mum or a dad or caring for a relative or being a mentor yeah and it can look different for everybody right it looks different from everybody and everybody's choice Mm. in life if you read any of those great sort of personal growth books development books you know there's a few in there that will say that there's one guy who earns 25 grand a year and is perfectly happy and living his best life you know or she's living their best life And then there's another person that earns, you know, 200 grand a year and it's not enough and isn't isn't happy at all. And Mm. uh, see what I'm saying? So it's it's absolutely is to do with meaning and purpose. Yeah, it's not at all to do with money. It's about feeling that what you're doing is worthwhile. Yeah, exactly. What you're doing is worthwhile and what you're doing for the greater good of not just yourself, but everybody around you. I mean, it can be that can be one way to meaning and purpose. But I think there's a danger in that. Oh, if you make people think that oh I can only achieve meaning through actually being altruistic and helping others and so on you know it it doesn't have to be through that it can be their own personal meaning that is one way to it but I think they're not going to find meaning in meaning in that because that's not part of their personality no no absolutely and you know what that's that's a really valid point actually because I think a lot of the time many of us are, are you know thinking all the time you know how's it how's this going to benefit and you know others or how can I help someone else and sometimes you forget that you just kind of make that your goal so much that you actually forget how are you actually being kind to yourself mm. helping yourself you know making sure you're taking care of your own self-care before the you know like you said before you meet the needs of others are you meeting the needs of yourself but I love meaning and purpose though I really do because my style of coaching I I very much focus on the future I focus on designing your future self what does that look like for you what are you working towards what is your goals actually placing value in that and finding meaning in that you know okay you said you would like this but what does that mean though what does that look like you know what's the value that you're going to gain from that what's it going to do for you for your own deep inner being and well-being sometimes people can want stuff but not really put any meaning or value into the reasons why they want them or why they desire something so I do think that actually values working out what your values are can really help in terms of finding Mm. meaning yeah values are very important if you know what your values are then you can make decisions based upon them yeah absolutely Absolutely. you pick the job that what is in line with your values Mm. you you pick a partner who's who meets the same values that you do and it is it's all of that it's being able to pass that on to your 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 family your kids your friends you know and it is once you have a, a values once you do your kind of like a values assessment or you have values in place of, of things that you believe in or hold dear then it means that you are then in a better position to know 
actually where to move forward to is does that work for you or does it does it fit in with your values or doesn't it you know and you can then make choices you make the right you know sort of decisions and choices based around those values definitely so now we know the nine needs Paula give us that read them down to us again one more time then so we've got control so, yeah so you can do your own sort of needs audit so looking at control how much control do you have in your life do you feel like there are any areas that you feel out of control or lacking control and how can you get more control and also like a nice exercise is actually thinking about what you can and can't control in your life and just letting go of the things that you can't control because you know a lot of people do worry about things they can't control which serves absolutely no purpose whatsoever security thinking about do I feel safe do I feel safe in this environment in this job in this relationship privacy how much privacy am I getting can I get more I mean sometimes you know even perhaps if you're working in a in a kitchen where everybody's working you know with their stuff and and chatting and actually just maybe just saying oh do you mind just giving me 10 minutes to focus on this because I need a bit of quiet time you know just saying that achievement thinking about, you know, what are you achieving? Are you achieving enough for you? Or are you being driven too much by your achievement? Your status, are you being recognized? And others, are you, you know, are you recognizing others? Hmm. Connection, do you have that connection? I mean, maybe you don't, maybe you're working all hours and you've let your friends drop, (laughs) you know, maybe it's time to revisit them. Absolutely. Uh, Community, are you in the right community for you? And what can you offer your community, perhaps? Attention, are you getting enough? Are you giving enough? Because, of course, the danger is, and many, many mums fall into this, you know, you're giving attention all the time (laughs) and you're not getting any. And finding meaning and purpose. So thinking about, yeah, your own values, what gives your life meaning. And and it might be something that's nothing at all to do with work. It might be that, you know, when you play the guitar and you're transported away somewhere into this different realm, you realise, God, you know, I only do that once a month. I should do that more. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. And you know what? Or everybody out there who's listening, I would highly encourage you to have some kind of external outside of work activity or passion that is really just just for you. And definitely a musical instrument. It could be drawing, painting, your exercise, you know, yoga, meditation. Highly recommend meditation. Definitely for all of those out there that uh, would like to try, even if it's just for five minutes of sitting in silence and just building up on that you know whether that's actually at home cooking on your own and just immersing yourself in that as an activity going out for walks definitely really important for you to have some kind of I think external activity or hobby that is really for you I know some people I've got friends who like to cycle go out on bike rides swimming but yeah just doing something for you right yeah yeah so I've spoken about all the needs So you can actually go through them all, control, security, privacy, achievement, status, connection, community, attention, and meaning and purpose, and actually look at your own life and how your needs are being fulfilled. However, we also have resources. So these are things that that are inherent to us. So I'm going to talk about some of the resources that that we have to help us meet those needs. So the first thing is actually what we've been doing today is being able to step into our observing self. So we have some two ways of being. We have the way of being when we're doing something. And we have another way of being when we're sort of watching ourselves and observing ourselves. So simply by stepping away and looking at those different needs in our life and sort of doing an audit using that very fundamentally will actually give us a a snapshot of where we are and if there's anything we need to change to bring in more things. Yeah. And interestingly, if you are suffering from anxiety or depression, stepping into that observing self and noticing that that anxiety is not you and you are not the anxiety is a nice way to, to separate yourself from it. So a lot of my clients talk about how they feel when they're depressed and they might use a metaphor like, oh, it's like carrying heavy suitcases or putting on a cloak. 
And then you can play around with the ideas of well, taking that cloak up or putting the suitcase down. So if you ever feel in something, then being able to step away from it and notice, oh, I'm feeling anxiety at the moment, mm-hmm. not I am anxious. I'm yeah. feeling anxiety. What does that feel like? It just helps you distance yourself. So again, just thinking about in a busy kitchen, if you are feeling stressed for instance yeah but I did this exercise with with somebody this week in a busy you know they were talking about being in a busy kitchen you know Mm -hmm. noticing what happens first and they were saying or the first thing they feel is the blood rushing to their arms and their chest and then they start feeling a sense of tension yeah Uh, and almost like it it rises up their body yeah and just, yeah. so just noticing if you can notice those things so that actually, yes, when you feel that that sort of hot flush start on your, you know, on your arms and you know it's going to hit your chest next and then, you know, it's going to go into those that shortness of breath. So being able to stop it then. So stepping out of yourself and maybe, you know, having a few seconds at the window or breathing or taking a glass of water can sometimes stop that feeling from, you know. And we teach this really nice breathing technique called 711, which is breathing in for seven and then out for 11, breathing into your uh, into your your tummy. And again, that's a lovely way for just stopping those feelings in their tracks. Yeah. You don't have to stand in a kitchen, you know, (laughs) some weird way. Nobody will know that you're doing it. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. That's the thing. Because I mean, I I can certainly say that when you're in a really busy kitchen, it can be hard for uh, chefs to step away, especially if you've got demands on you. It can be really hard to stop for a moment. I mean, there are opportunities to do that. And, and, you know, absolutely, if you're you're really feeling overwhelmed, uh, my, my advice is always just just you know, down, down tall and just yeah, step away. Because sometimes that start, that pause right. can make you more effective rather than leading you to un- unravel. So another thing that we have is our memory. So if you think about us as, as humans, you know, yeah. we are just storing all the different things that we're doing, all the different things that went well and all the different things that went wrong. And we are learning from them, which yes. gives us wisdom. So yes. obviously in a kitchen, I've seen you chop, <laughs> <laughs> so I know things eventually hit muscle memory, don't they? You do them yeah. without without thinking. And that yeah. applies to things in life, actually. You know, we meet we we meet a few people and certain things happen and they're all of a type. And then, yeah. then we meet this new person and our gut instinct kicks in and we don't know why that we're having yeah. these feelings about them, but actually our gut instinct is remembering things that went wrong with a person like this in the past, maybe there's signs that they're narcissistic or, you know, just something like that. And our body body often responds quicker than our, you know, our brains. So our body holds that memory, but also the memory and also logic, which is another one of our resources means that we can, you know, sit down if we have a moment and we are facing a particular decision Mm. and actually think things through. So yes. doing the needs audit is a lovely way of using your logic and your memory. Yeah, it's sort of rationalization. It's kind of like yeah. rationalizing. Yeah, a bit. being rational. So being, yeah, logic and ration, rationality is a, one of our resources, but equally emotion is another one of our resources. And that's yeah. what allows us to build those bonds, that connection, that sense of reality. Yeah. It allows us to notice what gives us meaning and purpose because it makes us feel emotions. So if we were, you know, zombies or or robots, we wouldn't have those clues as to what matters for us. The other thing about emotion is it allows us to feel empathy. So it allows us to understand Mm -hmm. where other people might be. And in a busy kitchen, you know, if you've got something going on, you need to understand how stressed somebody else might be that, you know, you might be able to help them a little bit. If you definitely I mean I really think that absolutely I mean I think you know everyone needs a bit of emotional training I think <laughs> especially you know in the kitchen there's a lot of emotions run high yeah. and, and quite busy environment in, and in hospitality in general lots of emotions run high but sometimes it's almost as if 
everyone's just expected to, you know, uh, leap over it, overcome it, just keep going, just keep going. And actually, if you are a, a manager, a, a leader, a head chef, then it is important to be able to read the emotions of your staff and to see if there is somebody in that in that room, in that, you know, in that kitchen that you can see is struggling and mm. to recognize that and to go over and actually support them rather than vilifying them yeah because it all might unravel yeah absolutely absolutely and then it's more detrimental than actually if you just addressed it look you know if someone's struggling in the kitchen it's important to be able to talk to them it's important to have that empathy that understanding and you know at the end of the day if you have to take that person away from that environment to give them a moment to themselves to give them time out to give them extra support then so be it it's far better to do that and have a, have a much happier staff and much happier workplace than it is to just leave that person and just literally push them to keep going and then in the end the per- what does the person do the person leaves and that's where you exactly. end up yeah they're not they're not getting that attention they're no. not getting any status no. yeah that's yeah. right absolutely absolutely these are amazing Paula these resources are really great as well to be able to understand and understand yourself and 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 all the things that you can do now obviously I'm conscious that we're running out of time and and I could talk to you all day about this and I'm sure everyone would love to keep listening but what I'm going to say is how can people get in touch with you Paula and how and and who do you work with okay so I work with people who are feeling overwhelmed or uh, you know a feeling that they have symptoms of anxiety or depression or I've had trauma basically the same things that any therapist would and people can reach me at thegoodtherapypractice.co.uk and there you can actually book up a, a you know a free chat with me just to see if, if we make a good fit really and if this type of therapy works for you Amazing. That is fantastic. Paula Gardner, the Good Therapy Practice. I just want to say thank you very much for being here today, for being my guest and sharing us your beautiful insights and knowledge. Hey, everybody, I hope you really enjoyed that. Thank you again. Thank you to the Birch Chef Project for letting me host these amazing podcasts and can't wait until next time. Thank you very much. Bye.